Are you new to the hobby and looking for a simple, straightforward project just to get you started? Or maybe you've been doing this for a while and you're just looking for something fun and easy to do in between projects? If so, this video is for you. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. This little fountain here, this is something that I built many years ago. I built it long before I had my hot wire cutter or a bunch of neat tools. I really didn't have much at the time, but I still managed to make this cool little piece. This project is the perfect project for somebody just getting started who does not have a lot of tools at their disposal and doesn't want to spend a lot of money on materials. It's gonna be made out of foam core. And this is foam core from the Dollar Tree. It is the Ready Board brand where the paper easily peels off. Good stuff, it's like a buck a sheet and this is enough to make like 20 fountains. I'm not gonna use a hot wire cutter or any super fancy tools. It's gonna be straight edge, exacto knife, some glue, some paint. That's mostly gonna be it. This thing is a hexagon and when I made this one, you can see on the back, I have a whole bunch of layout lines cause I drew out a hexagon from scratch on the foam core, which was a bit of a pain. This time around, I'm trying to make my life easier and your life easier. And I made this printable template that has a whole bunch of different sized hexagons that you can cut out and use as a guide to construct this or other pieces. These days, I would just do this on my hot wire table with my shape cutting tool from Shifting Lands, but that's not what this is about. This is kicking it old school, keeping it simple. And this is how we're gonna do it. This template I'm gonna make available for download. I'm not sure exactly where I'm gonna put it yet as a filming. So all of the info for how you can get it will be in the video description below. Let's make a fountain. First thing you gotta do is pick which size you want this thing to be. There's a whole bunch of different options here and you can make this as big or as small as you want. I want mine to be similarly sized to this one. So this part of the template seems about right. All you gotta do is cut it out. Now you could print out a bunch of these sheets and just cut them out as needed. Or if you wanna be more economical, you could just print out one, cut out each hexagon and glue it to some chipboard and then cut that out and have permanent jigs. Now you could just take this, place it on, trace it out and then cut it. Or because this paper is gonna get peeled off eventually anyway, you can just use a glue stick to glue it right on to your piece. You can even save yourself the hassle of cutting one of these lines. And it's up to you. You could use a straight edge to guide yourself again, or because this is gonna end up being stone, if you have a steady hand, you can just freehand it along the template. And there we have the bottom part of our fountain. We will put that aside for later. Now we need some of these walls here and these are a smaller area than the bottom and the top lip. What I think I'm gonna do is pick the next increment down and use that as the outer dimension for the upper walls. But this time I'm gonna go one line in and cut it right here. All right, there's one. You just have to decide how tall you want this thing to be. And I think three layers of this is gonna be what I want. And because I'm removing this fairly quickly and not using a lot of glue, I can just keep reusing this one bit of paper for the length of this project. It sure beats doing all this. I got three layers here and if they don't line up, if they're not exactly the same, that is not an issue. That will actually help us in the future steps when we try to make these look like individual bricks. I actually should have cut a second of the larger one before cutting down the guide to make these inner ones. So I'm gonna quickly make a second one right now. 
All right, let's get this big piece of foam out of our way. So now what I have is a lower frame, the interior walls, and an upper one. Obviously, we want this to be hollow, so I need to hollow it out. I haven't even removed the paper from this one yet, and that will help. So the interior walls are here. We have to decide how wide we want this frame to be. Now my increments on this template are a little bit wonky. I just reduced each one by 90%, but that scaled in a kind of strange way. I think I actually want the interior to be somewhere in between these two increments, because if I go to this one, that's how wide these are gonna end up being, and I don't want them flush. I want an inner lip. If I go to this one, it's gonna look too wide. So I'm just gonna cut something in between both. And I'm just gonna freehand this because it doesn't really matter too much. I can use the lines on this as a guide and just kind of keep it somewhat even between the two. And on this one, it's important not to run wild and create cross cuts that are gonna look bad later. Try to end right on these points. Now when doing something like this where you're cutting like this and you don't want to cross cut and run wild, you might end up going short. So it's good to flip it over and complete the lines from the back. And hopefully, boom, that can be put aside. Maybe we'll use that later. I don't think so though. And that is our upper frame. Now we have to do a similar thing with these ones. So you could, of course, take the guide, glue it onto your piece, and then cut out the interior to give you your frame. That's a pretty straightforward, easy way to do it. If you don't want to mess around with that, and you do want to practice what I think is one of the most important skills for any sort of layout builder crafter, you can practice finger gauging. It's a very simple technique used by carpenters to draw straight lines on the edge of a shape that is a consistent width from the edge. And essentially all you do, it's very simple, but it just takes practice, is pick the point where you want the line to be. Let's say I want it right there. You've set your pencil and you set your finger as a guide and you just ride the edge, holding it in the exact same position and you trace your line. Now this isn't gonna be laser accurate, but it's going to be accurate enough and likely just as accurate as using the, the paper template, which will probably move on you at some point. This is a great place to practice this technique. And then, just a matter of carefully cutting them out. Again, be careful not to run your cuts too wild. It's a good idea to start from a corner and work your way in. So start from the corner, cut most of the way, stop, go to the other corner, come at the line from the other direction. Carefully, very carefully, remove the piece. And that's gonna create the inner wall. Now it might seem like this is very difficult, precise cutting work, but it's really not. If you screw it up, it doesn't matter. It's a stone fountain and it's gonna look fine if there's some changes in your lines or whatever. It's, it's gonna look fine, but this is going to give you a lot of practice on the fundamental basic skills of layout and cutting. So it's a great place to screw up. The next step is to turn this styrofoam into something that actually looks like stone and brick. Simplest way to do that is just get a ball of aluminum foil and roll it around to give it some stone texture. You can also use a rock from the garden, an old broken brick, whatever, just something to give the foam some texture, especially on the edges. Be careful not to bend it like I just did and break it. <laughs> this is a little bit tricky just because the pieces are quite delicate. So just take your time and be gentle and make sure the piece is always supported in the opposite direction that you're applying pressure. 
here, I'm gonna support it with my hand and gently hit the edges. Now I don't want this to look like just one solid ring of like a cement or concrete. So I'm gonna create some grout lines by very gently scoring corner to corner. And I am not going deep. I'm only going one or two millimeters, trying to keep it as shallow as possible. Gonna go back in with a pencil and widen that groove. Again, not trying to go deep, trying to avoid making this deep. I'm only trying to widen it. You could, of course, go in and add more breaks if you'd like. Do I want that? Yeah, let's go in and add one more center break to each of these. Makes it a little bit more believable in the size of the stones used. When you're doing something like this, you always wanna make sure you continue that line break, that grout line, down the sides of the piece, otherwise it'll look really strange if you don't. Trick here is not breaking your piece in the process. Wanna add a couple little cracks in this, you can. Maybe a little bit more damage. Wouldn't go overboard with this, but it's nice to add some small details like cracking. On the bottom piece, you could go in and draw a whole bunch of intricate stonework if you would like. If you're gonna be filling it up with some sort of water effect, it's probably not gonna be worth the effort, but if you're gonna be keeping it looking like a dry fountain, that's a way to add a lot more interest to the appearance of it. Now these are gonna be the trickier part. We only need to really texture the outer edges since these will be stacked, but I gotta be very careful because these pieces are very thin and delicate. Now the trick here is to make these look like individual bricks. To do that, we're gonna again go in with the knife and cut the grout lines and sharpen them with a pencil. Gotta make sure you do ones on the outside corners because obviously there's gonna be a grout line on the corners. And then it's just a matter of adding the individual bricks. Not measuring these, just kind of eyeballing it and trying not to go too deep. And you want to carry that same pattern through to the other side, but you don't have to go across the top or bottom. An alternative way to do this is with a nail file and actually just going in and slightly making a groove with the file. However, this does create a wider, deeper groove than you might want. For gluing these, you could just use a hot glue gun, but they're pretty delicate pieces. So I'd actually suggest using PVA glue or tacky glue, which is just a thicker PVA. This is gonna be a very cheap option. You can grab a bottle of PVA for pretty much next to nothing. If you're using this method, I would suggest making one of these with all the cuts in it, gluing it, and then moving on to do this one so that this glue has time to tack up while you carve the next piece. I would apply the glue to the brick piece. That way you don't get it where you don't want it as much on the bottom piece. Using white glue gives you some time to move this thing around to get it positioned exactly where you want it. You wanna make sure you put some pressure on it to make sure you got good contact. And you can actually just take some push pins and hold it in place using those while it tacks up. And put that aside and move on to the next piece. Moving on to the next layer, there's a couple things I wanna point out. One is that I broke my piece and that's totally fine. I can still use it, I'll just glue it Together, it's getting stacked, it doesn't matter. The other thing to note is that because this is a brick pattern, I want the bricks to have an offset grout line, which you probably can't see too easily with this white object. But when doing the second layer, I made sure to offset my brick pattern by half a brick, give or take. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. And last, if you don't wanna go through all the effort of making these bricks, you don't have to. This one I made years ago, it's just solid pieces of foam core stood upright with a couple lines drawn on it and that looks perfectly fine too. But this is a great opportunity to practice your carving skills on a delicate piece. Once you have your layers of brick done, you can put on your top piece. And you wanna try to make sure it is in line 
with the bottom one, which is a little bit difficult, but if you run it around the table like this to flush up the edges, you can probably get it pretty close. Just be careful not to disturb the brick layers. It's not bad. And if you want to pin it, take your pins and go through the grout lines. That way you don't have a visible hole left later. And here I'm going to pin it through all the layers to keep it nice and secure. How long you leave these pins in is going to depend on the glue you used. If you use straight PVA glue, you're going to want to let them sit for quite a while. I'd almost suggest a couple hours. If you used tacky glue, it'll take less time. And if you used hot glue, well, then you don't need to pin these at all. You could also just put some weight on this, but then you run the risk of things shifting around and getting out of whack as they dry. And at this point, you could call the build portion of this done. This looks perfectly fine just the way it is. But you might want to add a centerpiece to this to make it look more interesting. Now in this one, I just used a Disney princess from Dollar Tree that I kind of cut up, broke the arms off, and painted to look like stone. Works perfectly well. You could realistically find any number of toys to use. I'm not going to go that route this time. One, because I've covered converting toys into statues multiple times, kind of including last episode. So instead, I'm going to add a stone center piece to this. And I think what I might do is actually just leave the top like a flat platform that I could put different miniature models on to change the look depending on the situation. So again, I'm just going to use my printout templates here and cut a stack of small hexagons that fit in the middle of this thing. Now, if by chance you're using this thing and you can't quite find something that's the right size, you want something even smaller than this or bigger, you can just change the resolution that you print it at. Print it at 50% scale and you're gonna get a much smaller guide. And we're gonna be very frugal here, even though foam core is very cheap we're gonna use these cutout scraps. It also saves us the hassle of cutting two sides. Those are gonna be the tops and bottoms. And I want a couple layers that are a bit smaller. You could just go ahead and keep it simple and stack these like this and make it look like individual big pieces of stone. Or you could do the same fake brick technique like was done on the bottom here. And I think that's what I'm gonna do. These pieces have a lot more surface area and aren't quite as delicate. So I'm just gonna switch to using hot glue for this so that I don't have to wait for the glue to dry. The most important part of a project like this is the Mod Podge step. Applying this is gonna seal and harden this foam and make it a lot less delicate and way more durable. I have a whole video about Mod Podge if you haven't seen it yet to check it out. Now, if you're just getting started and you really don't wanna buy much and you haven't bought this stuff yet, you can just use PVA glue that's been watered down and mixed with like some black paint. It works, it's not quite as good. This has some added benefits that I think make it worth it. You can find this in some dollar stores. Dollar Tree sells this in small bottles, so it's a pretty cheap investment and it goes a long way. My glue is not entirely dry yet, and the easiest thing to do would be to let it completely dry before applying this coating. A big part of this hobby and how to be successful with it is efficiency. And if I'm waiting for glue to dry, and then I apply this and have to wait for that to dry, that's super inefficient. If I can just wait for both to dry at the same time, it's gonna be a lot more efficient. So I'm going to apply it right now. Now that this thing is dry enough that I can comfortably handle it, it's time to move on to painting. Now, when painting stonework or brickwork, you can go as simple or as complicated as you want. And if you want an example of how you can do a more dynamic, kind of complicated paint job, just check the video up there. I have one dedicated just to that and you can kind of go crazy with it. But keeping in mind that I'm presenting this project for beginners, we're just gonna do it real simple and assume that you have a very limited palette and not a lot of experience. So I'm just gonna paint this in a series of grays. Doesn't really get much more simple than this. I'm going to base it out in a deep dark gray, 
then do a dry brushing of a lighter gray and then a very light dry brushing of vanilla. Now you actually don't even need all three of these colors. You could just have one and some white or just black and white and mix them together and go to town and practice your shade work. When doing the darkest color on something like this, you wanna get basically full coverage. Get a nice even coating on everything. Once the gray base coat is dry, we can move on to dry brushing a lighter shade. This is essentially just a practice of painting this with very, very, very little paint on the brush, a very dry brush to bring out some of the highest points. And a great paintbrush to use for this are these makeup brushes that you can buy in big packs for very cheap at the dollar store. They're nice and big and fluffy and soft so they are ideal for this application. I've worked off most of the paint from the brush. Now I'm gonna go in and just start lightly brushing the piece, just trying to hit the highest points. This gray isn't very different than the gray below it. It's only slightly lighter. So this is a very minimal effect. It's, it's not that drastic. Now without washing the brush, I'm going to do the same thing with this off-white or vanilla and I'm going to mix it right on the same paper towel that I used previously to kind of give me a tone that's in between the two so it's not as drastic of an effect. This time I have to be a little bit more cautious and not go too heavy-handed on this otherwise it could be kind of ridiculous looking. But essentially it's just going to highlight all the edges and add some dimension to the piece. And we could absolutely call this paint job complete. But if you want to take it up one more notch, you can apply a black wash. And you can make one of these in a very simple way by just mixing a little bit of black paint with some water with a drop of dish soap. And that's going to give you the most basic of washes or you can create a little bit better of a recipe and I'll put a link up in the info cards there for the video of this recipe. But this is totally optional, you can skip this. It's just kind of the next phase of crafting is getting comfortable using washes. Don't be afraid to put it on. I just kind of drip it all over and then I'll take another soft brush to kind of paint it on over everything. If your dry brushing came out way too drastic looking and it looked like the piece was glowing with white edges, this will help that quite a bit and tone it down. However, if you got your dry brushing looking exactly how you wanted it, this could reduce the effect. Just take some practice to know how things act and how you like things to look. The important thing to know is you shouldn't be afraid of this step. It's just paint. It's not gonna wreck your piece. If you don't like the way it looks, you can just repaint it. Dab away the excess. But for the most part, you're just going to want to let it sit and do its thing. Let's say after you applied your wash, you are feeling regretful that it has turned too dark and too black and you miss all that cool dry brushing effect that you had previously. No fear, you can just add it back. This is highly subjective. I personally do like my pieces to look a bit dark like this. I don't like them to look overly dry brushed, but if you want to bring some of those highlights back, you absolutely can. All you have to do is go in and dry brush it again. But this time you want to be very, very light with the effect and you do not want to use your lightest shade. You want to go in with one of the medium shade grays instead because you want this effect to be fairly subtle. It's more important than ever to get lots of paint off of your brush because if you don't, it will look very streaky and not very nice at all. Very lightly go over it again and bring back some of those highlights. And because I'm using a medium gray instead of a white or off white, the effect is a lot more natural looking. Very, very simple and easy to do. The real trick is just having a very minimal amount of paint on the brush. I loaded my brush once, really cleaned it off, and did the whole piece without reloading the brush. Simple. 
You could absolutely call this piece 100% done at this point. You could just glue this center plinth into the middle and call it a day, or actually just leave it separate and then you have this that you can use on its own or this that you can use for other things like an altar for a statue, for example. That would be a pretty smart thing to do. But if you want to add something a little bit more to this, let's say you want to add a water effect, you can do that without getting into anything too complicated or expensive. There's tons of resins on the market for this sort of thing, and they are fairly pricey. But if you want to go super cheap, dollar store, five minute clear epoxy. I pay $1.50 for this stuff. $1.50 Canadian. It's a fantastic deal. That being said, I do know that the dollar stores in Canada, Dollarama specifically, is really, really good in comparison to what a lot of people have, especially in the States. So you might not be able to find this at the dollar store, but it's worth trying or going to a place like Walmart or whatever, some kind of place that sells things fairly cheap to see if you can find some five minute epoxy, Home Depot, whatever. It's gonna be cheaper than a two part resin for small little things like this. I do have a link in my essential equipment store to where you can find something like this on Amazon as a last resort, but the pricing, to be honest, is not as good as it is at Dollarama. This stuff is phenomenal. You could absolutely add some vegetation to this thing to make it look a little bit more interesting like I did here, just putting in some flocking. If you don't wanna buy actual flocking, you could just use something like reindeer moss from the dollar store. This one, I wanna keep vegetation free because I think in the future I might want to use this to add some icy effects to. So we're just gonna keep the water clear and free of vegetation. So you wanna squeeze out as much of this as you think you're gonna need. And it is a two part epoxy that cures very, very fast. So you wanna mix it up and as quickly as possible, get it into your piece. I haven't glued this into it beforehand because it will actually be easier to pour this in without it. And then I can just use the epoxy to glue it. This stuff turns a little bit silver as it's starting to cure and that's what you want to see. This stuff is very, very thick. It is way thicker than a normal resin. That is its absolute downside. There are ways to thin it, but they require using materials and stuff that I, I don't have on hand, so I expect you wouldn't either. Because it's so thick, it doesn't flow very easily on its own into a large area. So I like to try to help it along the way with a popsicle stick or something. If you wanted, you can tint this stuff with some ink or some paint. Just use an absolutely minuscule amount and it will give it a little bit of color. Think something like a, a green or a brown will work quite well for water, but less is more. There, and once everything is kind of covered a bit, it will settle slightly and kind of flatten out. This does not work nearly as good as a thinner pourable resin, but you get what you pay for, a buck 50. Now I can just place this where I want it. And I just need to let this sit for a couple minutes while the resin cures. I'm gonna keep an eye on it to see if any large bubbles form. And if they do, I'm gonna pop them with a toothpick and then I'm done. That's the other advantage with this stuff versus the more expensive resin is that a lot of those will take several hours, sometimes 24 or 48 hours to cure. This one, five minutes, and then I can use it on the table. So there you go, a perfect project to get you started. Even if you do not have any of the stuff to make this, it really doesn't use anything too special. You can buy all of the stuff you need to make this for like five dollars that'll get you started and that's enough to make this and a whole bunch of other stuff to try your hand at the hobby this project is a perfect place to get your feet wet and try all the fundamentals of terrain crafting and if you make one and you don't think it looks very good just remember 
The one I made a few years ago also doesn't look very good, but you get better over time. Again, the link for the template for the hexagons, if you want to download it, will be in the video description below. I'll probably put it on DriveThruRPG as a pay what you want so you can download it for free or use it as a way to make a quick, easy donation to the channel. It's the support from you guys that allows me to make these videos every single week using my essential equipment page on blackmagiccraft.ca is a big contributor to how this channel financially operates. So if you wanna pick up some tools and supplies for yourself, go there, see the stuff I use, read why I use it, click the link, buy the stuff through Amazon, it costs you no extra and the channel receives a commission in the process. Another great way you can help the channel out is by supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. It's through the funds there that I can dedicate so much time and effort to this channel and these videos. There's some cool rewards like the private Facebook group, the Discord server, and getting to watch these videos a few days early. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'd love to see your fountain attempt. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments section below. And as always, thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, guys. Cheers.